Good Monday morning. Hope everybody's doing good. Had a great weekend. Uh, it's time for Coffee with Rob. We're in the book of Mark. Hope everybody enjoyed some college football. Um, yeah, man, it was a hot weekend here. I don't know about you all there, but uh, anyway, hope everybody's doing good. Let's get into Mark chapter 8. This is a good, an excellent portion of scripture, actually. Uh, this is our 29th lesson. Uh, in the book of Mark, Mark chapter 8, verses 27 to 30. We'll just be brief, but I'm going to compare uh, Mark, Matthew, and Luke on the same portion. One of the reasons I like this portion is, uh, is we're going to see in a minute, is that Jesus asked the disciples, who do people say that I am? And if you did that today, even in the world today, you're going to ask, who do you think Jesus was, or who is he to you? You're going to get a million different answers. Peter gives the correct answer. And the way you answer, or, or let me put it this way, your eternity depends on the way you answer this question. So this is one of the greatest confessions in the Bible, other than Thomas's confession after the resurrection. So I really like this because, again, Jesus asks, who do people say that I am? He wants, he just asks, and in, in, it's just an inquiry, but... The important thing is how Peter answers this. And the important thing is this. Every single person in the world is going to stand before God alone one day. And depending on how you, uh, your eternity depends on how you answer this question. Do you believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? And another reason I like this is because, uh, as I said last lesson, I talked about the elect. And, of course, the moment you talk about the elect, all the Calvinists come out of the woodwork and they blast you and they put scripture, scripture, scripture all over about being elect because they like being elect. And, hey, if you're elect and you love Jesus Christ, roll on with that. Nobody's going to convince me that Jesus elects one person for heaven and another person for hell based on his sovereignty. It's not going to happen. Why ask this specific question? Who do you say I am if everybody's been predetermined? And if you're not familiar with election or Calvinism, basically tulip is, is the five-point Calvinism. It means you're to, everybody's totally depraved. I agree with that. We're all depraved. We all need a Savior. Uh, we, all, we all come into this world of sin, and without a Savior, we're not going to heaven. We're, we are uh, totally depraved. That's one in tulip, T-U-L-I-P. The second one is unconditional election. You can do nothing to either be elected or not be elected. You're elected by God himself. He determines your eternal future. Uh, this is what Calvinists say. I do not agree with this at all. We'll never be convinced. I've studied this for 30 years. It's a convincing, it's a, it's a, it's a good argument. But the problem that I have mostly is that people that claim to be elected Boy, if you tell them you don't agree with it, do they go crazy? So you wonder, if we're brothers in Christ, why does it bother you so much? And uh, because you should just be happy that I believe in Jesus Christ. And then if you believe I'm elected, or I don't believe I'm elected, but I believe because of my faith in Jesus Christ, well, you should be happy for me. But, but the elect, these people will come out of woodwork and they will try to blast you on Facebook, they'll blast you online, and it just reveals to me the heart. I have seen more division cause and families over this questionable five-point Calvinism being elected or not being elected. Because some people will say, well, if you don't believe you're elected, you're not going to hell. You're not going to heaven. But isn't it interesting all the people saying that are convinced they are the elect? That's interesting to me. Because see, John says in 1 John, you can know if you've been saved. In 1 John 5, I believe it's 13. You can know. How do I know? Because I've confessed that Jesus Christ is my Lord. I've asked for forgiveness of my sins. I'm saved by grace through faith. He didn't elect me. He moved, He drew me to him in uh, John 12, 32, when he was lifted up. He draws all men. The Bible doesn't say when Jesus was lifted up, and Jesus doesn't say, when I am lifted up, I will draw the elect unto me. He does not say that. He says, I will draw all men unto me. Why? Because I am not willing that any man should perish, but that all should come to repentance. In John 3, 16, whosoever will may come. It's not the elect. It's not the elect. Yes, there is. Elect. So let me explain the perspective on elect. In the, before time began, 
the plan of salvation was already complete. In other words, there's a sovereign timeline that God has. Nobody's ever going to change that timeline. At certain times in time, from eternity, God is going to interject into, the, into time. In other words, Jesus came in the fullness of time. He came at the perfect time. From eternity into time at the perfect time in Galatians 4.4. 4. And this plan, 1 Peter 1.20, Titus 1.2, uh, Acts 4.23, I think it is, 4.28, 2.23, um, 4.28. There's all kinds of scriptures say before time, the plan of salvation was already completed. Why? Because even before time, God knew Christ was coming, and there was no way anybody was going to stand between Christ and the cross. If God says it, it's going to happen. So if you are in Christ Jesus, you become elect by believing in Christ Jesus. So I believe in Jesus. Now I'm in the elect. I'm in with Christ because of my free will, because of, I responded to the urging of the Holy Spirit, by the way, the Holy Spirit urges everyone to get saved. You can either resist it or you can receive it and believe in Jesus Christ. The choice relies on the individual. And so I believe in Christ. I have become elect. And my predetermined outcome, because of the plan of God, so my predestinated outcome is once I receive Christ and I become part of the elect family in Christ Jesus, by my free will, based on grace through faith, through my confession of faith, then I am predestinated to heaven. That's the plan. In other words, if you have a Roth account and you put your retirement money in there and you pay pre-taxes, the predestinated plan of the Roth account is when you draw your money out, you don't pay taxes in the future. That's the same thing with Jesus. I believe in Jesus Christ. I confess him as my Lord and Savior. I make that acceptance upon my own. Uh, and my own urging, and my own free will. I become the part of the elected family in Romans chapter 8, and my predestination is heaven, because that's all part of the plan, predestined before time. God does not determine who is going to heaven or hell. He leaves that decision up to the individual, but he does know who is going to heaven or hell from eternity past to eternity future. He sees it all. So, But we have the decision to make. You have a decision to make. And the most important decision you'll ever make in this world is, will I believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior or not? <clears throat> I am not elected. God did not choose me something special. He did not predetermine. And the verses in Romans that refer to that are referring to a people group, not to individuals. Uh, Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. He's speaking of the Edomites and the Hebrews and so on. So, it's not individuals. The elect love to hold on to that. They love to think there's something special. And you know you are if you're in Christ Jesus. But if your faith or your election doctrine is causing division in the Word of God, you better check yourself. You're wrong. So anyway, if you want to be believe you're elect, good for you. Go for it. I don't. I'm saved, a sinner saved by grace. God called me. I responded, and I am grateful. And we preach the gospel. So in other words, why would you preach the gospel if everybody was predetermined? Uh, and R.C. Sproul would say, well, because we have the privilege of working in the, in, for the kingdom and we get a chance to reward to find the elect. It's not an Easter egg hunt. We preach the gospel. We go out and tell people about Jesus Christ and hopefully somebody responds because of their free will. We are not finding elected individuals. We are finding people who realize their depravity, realize they need a savior, and they come to the cross and say, Lord, please forgive me. I'm a sinner. Save me by grace through faith. Cover me with your blood. Wrap me in your robe of righteousness, please. That's the plan. So we can become elect by decision, and our predestination is heaven after our decision to follow Christ. So anyway, uh, sorry, elect people. Don't argue. I'm not going to argue. So you know, there's just nowhere to go with that. Just I hope that people aren't turned off by the fact that they don't know if they're elect or not. God is calling all men to Jesus Christ. God is calling every single individual on this planet to the cross. Again, even all the way back in the Old Testament, God wants all men to come to repentance and turn, turn from their wicked ways and live. If you couldn't turn, if it wasn't your decision, God would have just said, this is the way it is. You're going to stand before the, the judgment and you're going to hell and everybody else that I've selected is going to heaven. 
It's not the way it works. So anyway, um, we're saved by grace through faith. Let's look at this. And this is why I said this, this question to Peter we're about to cover in Mark chapter 8 is so important because Peter has to make this confession. And so it says here in Mark chapter 8, verse 27, Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, and he asked all men this question. And we have to do it. There ain't a person on this planet that hasn't considered or contemplated believing in or rejecting Jesus Christ. Every person has made a decision. And on the way, he asked them, who do people say that I am? And so they reply. This is the disciples replying. Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, still others say one of the prophets. And uh, if you look at Matthew 16, uh, again, Matthew clears it up, is a little bit more precise. He says, some people say you are Jeremiah. Um, so John the Baptist was martyred, we know that. And so the common thing would be in that day, if you were, um, you know, superstitious, that John the Baptist rose from the dead. Herod thought that, that he was coming after him because he killed him. Others say Elijah. Now, they won't admit that Jesus is the Christ, but he's the, they would say Elijah, risen from the dead, because people thought Elijah would return. And certainly in Malachi, it says that Elijah will come before Christ uh, comes on the scene. So they would believe that. But it's just really hard for them to acknowledge that he is the Christ. And still others say one of the prophets in Matthew, again, it says Jeremiah. And so, and I think it's in Deuteronomy, maybe it's 1815, I didn't write it down, but that the prophet uh, would come in the in the future. And so they're saying, some say a prophet, Matthew says it was Jeremiah. But this is the key question. And this is a key question for every person that is listening or watching or thinking about eternity or death or whatever. Who do you say that I am? This is the most important question you can ever answer in your life because this is the only question that will have eternal consequences in your life. Who do you say that Jesus is? And what does, what does, um, uh, what about you, he asked. Who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, you are the Christ. Now, if you can answer the same way, you can be saved. You can invite Christ into your life and, uh, and you will be saved answering that way. If you do not believe that Jesus is the Christ, that he was merely a prophet or merely a teacher or merely a miracle worker or even a legend, you are not going to heaven. Your sins will not be forgiven. And so I'm begging everybody, make the confession and then figure out as you grow in Christ who he is and what he means to you. But the confession and the most important question you can ever answer is who is Jesus Christ to you personally? Because every person, will stand before God alone. You are not going to stand before God with your family or your wife or your friends. Nobody's going to vouch for you. You're not going to point the finger and say it's his fault or her fault that I didn't make it or nobody told me. It's not going to wash with God. You're going to stand before God and be held accountable for, number one, this main decision. And you can look at it. I think it's Revelation 20. And I can't imagine the feeling that people, when they start looking for their name in the Lamb's Book of Life, and it's not there. I can't imagine the horror that people will feel when they realize that their name's not written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And so, let me see here just real quickly. Here it is. Revelation 20, uh, verse 12. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and the books were open. There are books. There are books that Jesus keeps uh, of our tears, our actions, our birth dates, those things. And another book was open. Some, some of that will be for reward. It's all recorded. Another book was open, which is the book of life. And then this is where this question will have influence on whether your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. And another book was open, Revelation uh, 20, verse um, 12 and 13 here. And the, and the dead were judged according to what they had done. As recorded in the book. So the dead were the God is the God of the living, not the dead. So these are people that are being held accountable for not being for not believing in Jesus Christ. So they're going to be judged by their deeds and they find out that their good does not outweigh their bad. The only way to do that is to have the blood of Christ and to be forgiven. Then you're you're instantly have his righteousness, which outweighs your bad deeds. So a book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done. 
These are people that try to work their way to heaven. They're going to, this is, oh, I'm going to work my way. It's going to be up to me. I'll get there. And they're going to find out that all you had done does not add up. And they were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books. And the sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. Each person was judged according to what they had done. They were judged by their works because they were not saved by grace and what they had done. Then, so their name wasn't found in the book, by the way, and that's coming up. Verse 14, then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. Now, a believer in Christ will never experience the second death. If you can say, as Peter does, you are the Christ, or you are the Messiah, you are the Son of the living God, if you can believe that in your heart, you will never experience the second death. People who deny Jesus Christ, and they try to work their way out, I'm a good person, I do a lot of good deeds, God's going to let me in based on my merit and my good deeds. That's what's being judged here, your good deeds. Your denial of Christ, thinking you can work yourself into heaven, you're not going to make it. We cannot make it. I cannot make it. I believe in Christ, and I'm going to stick with that. Uh, because of him, not because of me. Because of him, not because of me. Then death and Hades were thrown in a lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. If you do not believe in Christ, you will experience this death. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire, which is the second death. If you're in Christ, you will not experience this. If you reject Christ, this is your day being being spoken of in Revelation 20, verses 14 and 15. Please believe in Christ today. Accept him as your Lord and Savior. Get this question settled before it's too late. And I'll give you a story. I had a friend of mine that wanted to be baptized on a Sunday morning. This is no joke. I was at a ball game here, and I got a call saying that, this certain person had died. And I went to his house, and it was true. He was killed in a motorcycle accident. It was a Saturday night, and he had told all his friends on Sunday morning he was going to give his life to Jesus Christ. He did not make it to church that next morning. However, in my mind, and in grace, if he had already made that confession, already told his friends he wanted to give his life to Christ, his heart was probably right, and I would say he already made the confession. The only thing we did not do was baptize him. And so it was one day earlier than what he expected to go. He was killed on a Saturday night, and he was going to make his public confession Sunday morning. Now I believe he's in heaven. And so uh, because after talking to his family, he had changed quite a bit for this moment. So anyway, please don't wait till it's too late to receive Christ. Make this confession to believe that Jesus is a Christ. It doesn't matter what other people say. What they say shouldn't influence you. You have to determine for yourself who Jesus Christ is. And that's why Jesus asked these two questions. Who do people say that I am? Don't let them have any bearing on your life. Listen, you can learn from anybody. But if they're denying the Christ, you need to move on and make that determination that Jesus is the Christ. And so that's why he asked Peter the same question. But who do you say that I am? And we're going to get that same question in eternity. So... Anyway, that's the lesson for today. Um, if we looked at Matthew, Matthew 16 covers the same thing. Uh, Jesus asks Peter, and then he goes into the things Peter will do. Uh, Upon this rock, I will build my church, and the gate of Hades will not overcome it. So basically, there's a, there's a little bit more in-depth in, depth in uh, Matthew 16 after Peter's confession, and there's a little bit more in Luke as well. If you look at... Um, Luke uh, chapter 9, verse 18, and Jesus says, Who do the crowd say that I am? And they answer again. And then Jesus says, Who do you say that I am? And Peter answers, Christ of God. And then Jesus strictly warned them not to tell anyone. Uh, he said, and then he gets into him going to the cross. Now, three different accounts of the same situation. One talks about Peter. One talks about Jesus going to the cross. And some people have asked me, why does Jesus say don't teach? Well, number one, they're not ready for the heat that's coming when they start preaching about Jesus Christ. Number two, he doesn't need any more fame. Number three, they're not qualified to speak yet. They, they don't have the Holy Spirit. They don't have the knowledge they need. They don't have the depth of knowledge to defend the faith or defend the message that they would preach if they went out and told people that Jesus was a Christ. How would they know that? It would say, well, Scripture, this and this. But... And not until after the cross and the resurrection did the message really resonate with 
Peter and the disciples. When they realized that they had seen Jesus Christ alive, then they were ready to preach. When they were empowered by the Holy Spirit, Acts chapter 2, then they were ready to preach. Up to that point, Jesus says, don't tell anyone. Just keep it, meditate on it, and, uh, and, and I'll reveal more stuff to you as we grow closer together. So, Mark chapter 8, keep that in mind. Um, again, don't let the Calvinists get, get in your head. Uh, total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, limited atonement, that which is only for the elect. So just remember that um, this is unlimited atonement. The the gospel is worldwide. The blood of Christ is good enough for everyone. There is no limited atonement. It's unlimited. Who whosoever will may come. Irresistible grace, which means if you've been elected, your God's going to slam you into heaven whether you make that decision or not. You can't resist it. Uh, and then preservation of the saints. But anyway, don't waste your time on that. It's good to study. It's good to know. I've studied it for years. I, I went to study some schools in Pennsylvania and some other things. But listen, you're saved by grace through faith. Everybody's welcome. Jesus does not elect one person for heaven or hell. And the, the, the thing in Romans that talks about that is referring to people groups and the people groups that came from uh, Jacob and Esau, which one was God's favorite people. One was the Edomites that attacked, or the Malachites that attacked God's favored people. So it doesn't refer to individuals. He does not select one for heaven or one for hell. It's based on your confession. If you believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, you're going to heaven. If you deny the Christ, if you tread his grace under your feet or his blood under your feet, unfortunately, your name will not be in the Lamb's Book of Life. And when it's open, you will experience a second death, which is eternal separation from God. And I hope that doesn't happen to anybody. I'm doing this to encourage people to come to Christ. I'm doing this to help build people's faith. I don't want anybody to miss out. I don't care if you like me or hate me. That doesn't bother me. I want every person I talk to to know Jesus. And I tell my friends even at work, they're like, why do you talk about God? Why do you pray with us? Because I don't want one person at the day of judgment looking at me saying, why didn't you tell me what you know? That'll never happen because I'm telling everybody. I believe in Jesus. He's our Lord and Savior. He's the only way to heaven. And I'm hoping that everybody will understand that, receive him, confess him, read your Bible, pray, go to church, a Bible preaching church, and get closer to your Lord and Savior. So hope everybody has a great day. Um, we'll see you uh, Tuesday morning. See you tomorrow. So have a great night.